So I'd like to start by defining synthetic biology. It's an emerging field that builds itself as the merger between engineering and biology. And I think you can break it into two scales. On one scale, people are working on reproducing the control logic that we're familiar with from electrical engineering into genetics. So in the middle, you'll see these are lawns of E. coli that have a circuit in them that makes them act as photographic film. So you shine red light on them through a filter, and they reproduce an image. And uh, you can get the bio bricks for this from MIT and make your own photographic E. coli. And that's one scale of synthetic biology, and they take that up to whole metabolic networks. On the other scale, we're redoing whole genomes. So the first genome that I know of that was attempted this way was the bacteriophage T7, which has overlapping genes, and a group at MIT unoverlapped them. That was interesting. Probably the most famous one is Mycoplasma mycoides, which the Venter group chemically synthesized recently. And my group is working on yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. To ask any yeast geneticist, this is the best model organism. It's small, it's really manipulable, it's forgiving to even baby biologists, it's hard to kill, hard to, it's impossible for it to kill you, it's generally regarded as safe by the FDA, and we've been using it for at least 5,000 years, the earliest records of beer and bread are from the ancient Egyptians. We think they discovered yeast by accident and perpetuated it for us. So it's a simple genome. It's relatively small if you're used to human genetics or mouse genetics. It's got 250 introns, 6,000 genes. And it exists as a haploid and a diploid, which means it's pretty manipulable. So we're meddlers. We thought, let's make this organism, which is awesome, even better. The problem we're going to run into is called the fitness ratchet. We have the best of intentions, but even very modest changes are going to add up, and we're going to result in, eventually, a dead yeast. We expect this. We have a plan to get around this, an escape hatch, a site-specific recombination, which I don't want to get too technical, but uh, symmetrical LOXP stem sites flanking certain genetic features, perhaps genes, can be induced with a special protein called recombinase to combine with each other and induce rearrangements in different orientations. So if the LOXP stem sites come together in one orientation, you'll get an excision. A piece of the DNA will leave the genome. If it, in another orientation, it'll rearrange itself. And these LOXP stem sites don't have to be anywhere near each other for these events to happen. So what we think we can do is start modifying the yeast, and if it starts to get sick, we can use this escape hatch to rearrange it. And even better, if we have a goal for it, if we have a working yeast and we'd like to make it better, if we'd like to minimize it, if we'd like to teach it to work on a different fuel, say maybe make it eat chitin or produce biofuel, we can also use this system to select for traits and rearrange it so it becomes more robust. So one particular thing we're looking for is a minimal genome. That we think there's more than one because networks in genetic networks tell us that there are buffers. You have this pathway or that pathway, and you can take one out, but you can't take both out, which means there's at least two minimal genomes. We don't want to make choices about which genes or which features to take out. We want the yeast to do it for us. So we're going to engineer this yeast to conduct that experiment for us. Anything that survives on the other end with a smaller genome is a more minimal genome, and we can keep doing that until it stops minimizing itself. All of those genomes are the minimal genome set. So now we're ready to redesign yeast. We are going to remove all introns, tRNA genes, transposons, and all their associated repeats because those are hot spots of genomic instability. We're going to tag every single gene for detection so we can pull it back out with a microarray or with PCR. We are going to see with site-specific recombination sites, that's the LOXP sites, all the way through the genome so we can do the genomic rearrangements. But with the long view of actually building this thing, we're also going to seed the genome with restriction enzyme recognition sites. Restriction enzymes are enzymes that cut DNA at specific sequences. So it's a really popular tool with molecular biologists to manipulate DNA. Now the problem is we don't want to do this by hand. When I joined the lab a long time ago, they actually did synthetic design in Microsoft Word which, yeah, I, that's what I said, too. So the first thing I did was to write a very simple synthetic design program called Gene Design. You can find it at genedesign.org, and it lets you design synthetic genes. It does not handle genomes. So that was actually my thesis project, is, is a suite of algorithms and control software that you can use to design any plasmid, chromosome, or genome that you want. We call it BioStudio. It got kind of big. We have 
I don't believe in reinventing the wheel, so I packaged a lot of open source software into it. We use a Moodle to interact with the students, and I'll talk about how the students come into it. Uh, the team members who are actually doing the design use GBrowse as the GUI. Everyone else can use MediaWiki to interact with us. We want to be really open with the whole community about what we're doing. And uh, we use Ruby on Rails as an interface for the workflow management, BioPerl, Git as version control. Um, everything is open source, and the whole package will be available to anybody who wants to try and build a genome like us. The first step for us is annotation. This is every commit we make is the annotation of every genome version, and it looks just like this. It's not too human readable, but if you hand this to another geneticist, we use a sequence ontology, so every feature is exactly what they would expect it to be. So we're not inventing new features. Well, we try and invent new features that fit within the ontology so that it'll be universally understood. And once it's in this format, the GFF3 format, which is an open source format, it can be used very easily, plugged into this visualization tool called GBrowse. It's a really wonderful tool, and it's open source. And this is how all the biologists interact with the design software, because it's a nice GUI. So you can see there's, a, this is a length of chromosome, it's chromosome five. And you can see the overview, then a, re, a region panel where there's site-specific or combination sites, so you can see they're all over the genome. And then you have a gene view, and the genes are color-coded. This is really nice. If it's red, it's essential for the haploid gene. So if you're editing this and you see you're messing around with the red gene, you are in danger of killing your yeast. Just be careful. If it's purple, it's required for fast growth of the genome. And if it's blue, we know it's a gene. The lighter blue it is, the less sure we are that it's a gene. So this is the view that all of the biologists use to actually analyze and edit the, the chromosome. So back to our tasks, our design tasks, the PCR tags are the unique tags we put in so we could find any gene wherever it went. So remember when we pulse with Cree recombinase, some of these genes are gonna disappear. So we want to have tagged them so that we can tell very easily with a high throughput screen which ones disappeared from which strains of yeast. So to do that, we use gene design, which has a recoder. It'll take any sequence and recode it. So it means the same in biological terms in the peptide, but it has a different nucleotide sequence. And all of the tags we picked in every single gene are unique in both the wild type genome and the new synthetic genome. So we can put all of these on a microarray and just screen our strains. And there's a shot from GBrowse down there. The, the genes are the line that's a gene density along the chromosome, and the purple blocks are everywhere we have PCR coverage for this chromosome. And it's only in genes. We made a very early design decision not to modify non-protein uh, coding sequence. We understand how protein coding sequence works. It's in codons. We don't really, we can't really predict how non-protein coding sequence works. So that sequence we only delete. We don't edit. So once we've picked all the PCR tags, we can test this. This was the first test of any of my algorithms. So what we have are panels, um, wild type yeast, all wild type DNA, synthetic yeast, and then two panels where the yeast is diploid. So it has a wild type version of a chromosome and a synthetic version of a chromosome. And then the very bottom panel is where the wild type and synthetic chromosome were fused, and then the wild type arm was lost. And in each of these panels, you have a pair of PCR tag assays where the top one is wild type and the bottom is synthetic. This has a pointer? Okay. So here, wild type tags are lighting up and the synthetic tags aren't. Perfect. That's wild type DNA. Here, synthetic tags are lighting up and wild type tags aren't. Perfect for synthetic DNA. Here you see both. Sets of tags are lighting up, and it's a diploid wild type synthetic. And here you can see where the break is. That is where the wild type chromosome was lost, and the rest of this is synthetic. So we can tell that our PCR tags are working. We can probe for synthetic sequence. It's very nice. The next design algorithm I wanted to do was we want to make sure we, we're sure yeast is safe, but it would be nice if we could addict it to a laboratory substance or modify it some way so that if it gets out, it doesn't wreak havoc. So we decided to remove one codon from usage in the entire genome. We took the TAA codon out. We replaced it with TAG. But that's, it's not as simple as it sounds because just like that bacteriophage, yeast has overlapping genes. So our algorithm will let you take any codon out anywhere. But it looks out for these cases where here, oops, sorry, if you take TAA out, it's not going to mess with the code of the overlapping gene. In this case, it will. This TAA change to TAG is going to change this valine to an alanine. So you can still make the change, but BioStudio 
flags all of these for curator attention. So um, that's probably a pretty minor change, but you should still know about it. That's on the single codon scale. On the wide codon scale, you can recode whole genes. You can say, I want this gene to be more highly expressed or less highly expressed, or I want to mess up the secondary structure of this gene. And so you can take a peptide like this with its original sequence, and you can recode it up to 39% different um, and still maintain the original peptide sequence. So that's our main modus operandi is we do not change peptide sequence, but we can have a lot of effect on the nucleotide sequence inside, which lets us do things like put in restriction enzyme recognition sites. The algorithm here is you take a restriction enzyme site and its recognition site um, in six frames. So this is forward one frame, forward two frames, forward three frames, backwards one frame, backwards two frames, backwards three frames. You translate it into um, peptides and scan the peptide sequence for it, and anywhere you find that peptide, you can put that restriction enzyme site in. So now we have a bunch of different versions. We needed a nomenclature for versions, so we can identify DNA sequence down to 60 base pairs in any version of our yeast. So chromosome version, genome version, and organism. So it's very open. It's not just software for yeast, although we use it for yeast. And that lets us now break down the chromosome into pieces from a chromosome. We break it into 30 kilobase pieces called large chunks. It's a very technical term. Those are broken into 10 kilobase chunks into 750 base pair building blocks, which are assembled from 60 to 80 base pair oligos. We order from an oligosynthesis company. Those oligos are assembled by PCR back into building blocks, which are assembled with Gibson assembly back into chunks, which are put together by restriction digestion and ligation with those restriction enzyme sites we put in into bigger chunks, which are then homologously recombined back into the chromosome. And that's how we iteratively put the synthetic genome in. Um, the restriction enzyme question was a problem because restriction enzymes have different efficacies and prices. So this is actually where my plan of study came in use. Uh, we needed an objective function to figure out how to put restriction enzyme sites in. We don't want to modify essential genes if we can help it. The restriction sites are already all over the genome. Some of them are going to have to be removed. Some will have to be added. And if you look at the problem, we want one every 10 kb to break it into chunks, but we'd like some special ones at other uh, distances so we can actually have the chromosome be pretty modular and manipulable. And that is a really ugly brute force problem. And we did it by hand first, then we tried brute force, it didn't work. But I took algorithms for my plan of study, and that is a nested overlapping subproblem, this dynamic programming. And once you switch it to dynamic programming, it's completely tractable. So here's my advisor's take on this problem. It's the first panel. He took months, months to do this. And you can see the lines are the restriction enzyme sites, and they're poorly spaced. The cost with our objective function is high. The bottom panel is what BioStudio did in five minutes with a cost of 2.1, and he's never gone back to doing it by hand. Now that we can do that, we get a mighty undergraduate army. We call them the build a genome class. We give them all of our oligos, and they do the PCR and the assembly, and they start building our genome for us. Um, all of the kids in this picture have gone on to grad school, some of them with us. We've had over 120 students since 2007. We run it summers, winters, springs, and falls. And uh, they have a pretty good success rate. It necessitated more algorithms I can't talk about now. They generate so much data, we had to build a very powerful database and workflow process. This is just a single slice of the database to keep up with their production. But long story short, it works. Here is the wild type yeast growing on regular media. Here's our synthetic yeast. So it's um, just got a one chromosome arm replaced, but that chromosome arm did have essential genes, so we know it's working. And this is the LOXP induction step, where we're actually making the yeast rearrange itself. And what you'll see is the wild, there's no, you can't see a morphological difference between the wild type and synthetic yeast, so that's good. Our synthetic yeast is healthy. But when you actually do the experiment and induce LOXP, you see that, I don't, I hope you can see this, there's very tiny little colonies on the synthetic. Those are sick rearrangements. That's the fitness ratchet working. <sighs> If you grow those colonies up, rearrange them, grow them up on YPD, which is the standard media, they all look good. But then you see that they evince different phenotypes when you insult them with various chemicals. So what we have here is we've generated different strains of synthetic yeast 
that have different phenotypes, and we're going to be able to probe them and figure out what their phenotypes are and how the whole system works, but this is the proof of principle for a system. So luckily, we were able to submit this to Nature. We just heard that it's accepted, so look for that publication that a fully synthetic chromosome arm, we actually have two for this publication, function and use and generate phenotypic diversity by design. So it's very exciting. It took every year my advisor says five years until we're done, and it's always five years in the future. But it took a lot of people to do this, and um, probably more than are even on this slide. So, but I'd like to thank all of you for listening and Pro for this wonderful opportunity. So thank you very much.